Um, what are we going uh, to present today is in line with what we um, presented as well last year. So we want to give a brief introduction on how to get started in terms of uh, development on PlayStation and combine it with, obviously, Unity support. And, and then Colin is going to uh, talk about all the tech wizard stuff that he knows about and I don't. Um, this is pretty much what we're going to cover today. Um, again, signing up, getting Unity running on PlayStation. Uh, the favorite subject, which is TRC and QA, and then publishing your title on the store. And all the rest is going to be up to Colin. So how do I start? Um, you have a great idea, or you want to, in general, bring your Unity game to PlayStation. All you need to do is to sign up as a developer. Um, you will also get access to uh, the full SDK. So you will not only get access to the Unity side of things, but you will also get access to the full PlayStation SDK. Um, the SDK comes also with the full support that is provided by us. Um, we, are, we have a booth as well in the main area, and we are all the dev support team. Um, come and talk to us. How do you register? Um, it's free, first of all, which is always good. Um, we have that amazing URL there, which is companyregistration.playstation.com. Um, you just go on this great website, you register, you sign some amazing paperwork that we friendly call Global Developer and Publisher Agreement, also known as GDPA. And as I said before, once you are registered, once you are a, a full developer registered with us, you will have access to the full SDK, full support, full documentation, and you will enter in the magic uh, world of our support website. Once you sign up, a production manager will take care of you, uh, will be in contact with you, and also from the support side, we will offer support in a variety of areas that Colin will cover later on. The registration, which is important, applies to all platforms and all regions. We um, are still <laughs> operating on a regional level, even though less. Uh, but once you register with one region, so for example in Europe, your registration will be valid in US and in Japan and in Asia as well. And all platforms. Um, there are some things that are still required, hence the sign. Um, you'll need a dev kit to develop your awesome game. And you will need to test the application before submitting it to us, which sounds pretty much fair and incredible to say. But we also have people that submit games without testing them. So it's not going to work very well. Um, in terms of getting Unity, Unity is available for free for, for all PlayStation developers, like I said before. Uh, latest version available are 5.3 and 5.4 beta. You can download them from our support site. Once you get registered and approved, you just raise a request and we will give you access to the uh, Unity build. And you will also have Unity forum support directly on DevNet. Um, 5.4 is also known as the best performance version of Unity on our platform. Um, once you have done with your awesome game, we have a submission process. So that's the favorite one uh, of everyone. Um, once your game is ready, you submit it to us, to our friendly people in QA, called Forma QA or FQA for friends. It's free to do that. Um, at, each mo at this moment, you will need to submit three different or four different SKUs for um, the region you want to publish your game on. So if you want to publish in Europe, you will need to submit to Europe and then to US separately. Um, we're working hard to simplify this, but it's taking quite some time. Um, in terms of submission process itself, um, our testing, like I said before, is focused on TRC. Um, I'll cover this in a bit. We won't be testing functionality issues, which is why uh, I kindly ask you to test your game before sending it to us. Um, however, if something weird happens during testing, we will let you know, or the QA team will let you know. 
and the submission uh, cycle turnaround time is five calendar days. Um, our QA team are working uh, every day, even Saturday and Sunday. Good for them. Um, <laughs> thank you, QA. Um, <coughs> You can also contact QA directly uh, by using their internal communication tracker. Uh, in addition to this, we also have, as I mentioned before, our support website, so you can contact us. But if you need to speak directly with the QA guys, you can use their website. Um, you'll get a very fast response. Um, they are very happy to help, and they are nice people. Um, in terms of TRC, uh, we call it TRC, it stands for Technical Requirement Checklist. Um, what we are going to test your application against is a set of um, items that go very, very long and boring, but make it fun. So I'll say quality, compatibility, branding, business policies, system securities, and a lot of other things that they sound very complicated, but they're not. Um, we are working hard to simplify the old requirements, and trust me, they're not very hard to follow. It's mostly known as common sense. Um, legal requirements as well, and all of that. But once you pass through our submission process and everything is done and your game is approved, how do you get it on the PlayStation Store? Um, once your game is passed, you will be able to publish it. Uh, it takes approximately one week from the moment your game has received the OK from the QA team to the moment your game gets on the store. Um, we just need your metadata, all the description thingy, uh, in order to populate the store description from you. Um, the entire process is essentially done in background. So the only thing you need to provide us are, as I said, a set of messaging, images, long description, and all the amazing text that you might want to advertise your game with. And after that, I'll just slowly back away and leave the stage to the tech wizard here, Colin. Cool, I get the laser. <laughs> wow. <laughs> OK, uh, so we've done some of the kind of uh, business type things. Uh, we've got a stand here, so if you have any other questions, just come and see us after. We're not going to take questions in the session. So I'm going to go a kind of technical overview of the PlayStation platforms. So first of all, because I'm old, this is my history. This is what I grew up with. But I'm not allowed to talk about those today, so bye. This is the current PlayStation range. So we've basically got kind of three platforms that we're having people develop the software for. Yeah, we have the PlayStation Vita, our portable platform, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation VR, which is kind of a new platform, even though it's actually an accessory for PlayStation 4. So. Vita first, I'll get this over. Vita's kind of interesting. It was a, our second portable, and effectively it was a quad-core ARM CPU tied together with at the, what at the time was a pretty state-of-the-art Power VR graphics subsystem. It was kind of like half a PlayStation 3 in a portable package. And we engineered it for continual use in kind of games. So rather than being used for like peak performance of short periods of time. It's actually designed so you could be playing for like hours and hours on end. And this actually came in with some interesting design considerations. So with the CPU, we actually ended up clocking our CPU very kind of uh, like quite low speed, about 333 meg, much lower than the kind of uh, figures you see for kind of phones, just because we didn't want to actually have something we'd, we'd have to have like throttling or dynamic clocking. The kind of thing where if you've got something like a phone, it, it runs nice and then the phone gets hot and it slows down. Uh, we put all the effort into the actual graphics and we had a system with a split VRAM as well. Uh, the intention was to actually have a very high bandwidth path to the graphics that was separate from the main memory system. Okay. Then PS4. Uh, so PS4 is our kind of current main platform. Uh, it's very simple, as you can see from this diagram. It's basically two components on a single chip. We have an eight-core kind of x86 class CPU from AMD. Uh, it's not kind of like their highest end. It was even at the time we kind of took it, it was kind of quite low to mid-range. Uh, 
we clock it at 1.6 gigahertz uh, and when you're actually writing games you actually have access to six to six and a half cores with our OS taking the rest for the background processes. And then that's you know, piled together with a GPU with a, a single unified memory pool. Uh, the GPU was uh, kind of AMD, kind of GCN class, uh, runs about 1.8 teraflops across 18 compute units. And we, you actually program it with a kind of custom graphics library we give you. Uh, which is very low level. It's one of the things we've always done with the kind of consoles. We've had a thing where if we can give you access to the hardware and it makes sense, we'll do that. We don't abstract things away on a, a kind of fixed platform because we want the guys to be able to get things running but then get the extra performance out of it. And again, if you've got any kind of questions about that, come and talk to me at the stand. I'm here for the next couple of days. And then finally, we got the PlayStation VR. So PlayStation VR is not really a technical platform itself. It's more like a peripheral for PlayStation 4, but there'll be games that support it specifically. It's effectively a kind of 1080p OLED screen split between left and right eyes with some custom optics that have an interesting kind of like a barrel distortion characteristics. So you actually have more detail in the center of your view than you do in the peripheral. And the libraries we actually supply for people to use in VR take advantage of that to kind of like get the resolution where your kind of eye focus is. Uh, it's as a headset, it's not just the kind of video components important as well. The audio is also important. And we actually have like a complete 3D audio solution that has kind of independently tracked audio sources that move or stay put in the world as you move your head. And that's actually handled by the processing box on, with the uh, PlayStation VR. So it's not something you worry about in your game code. You just send the sources. Uh, and finally, with PlayStation VR, there's something that we probably did slightly differently to most of the other VR companies. Uh, we had this idea of what's called a social screen. So while someone's actually playing with the headset, you can still see either what they're looking at on the TV or more importantly, the game can actually have a different image to the television. So you can have the kind of games like party games where you know, a couple of players could be putting items on the TV screen that then appear in the kind of VR world for the, the guys being really immersed in it. So another technical thing with the PlayStation VR, uh, we support like 90 hertz and more importantly 120 hertz refresh rate. Uh, and we actually offer this in our libraries with not just the you know, 120 hertz rate on its own, but also what we call late reprojection. So the idea is that the VR headset itself has sensors that are kind of running about 8 kilohertz, giving your kind of orientation, your head, acceleration. And that, 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 value, is, that value is like fed back in the libraries to give you a new view matrix that you can then supply to the GPU very late in the frame, or actually have our reprojection library kind of distort your current view to make it look like it's actually completely rock solid. And this actually really does help give a, a real sense of kind of like solidity in the kind of your VR experience. And it, it's also really useful for something that's important to us in terms of the console, because uh, it allows us to cheat. So obviously PlayStation 4 is a fixed hardware platform. So if I want the best visuals in a game, Doing it at 120 hertz is really, really quite difficult. So we actually have a mode in our libraries where you can run your game at 60 frames a second. So your game is generating new scenes, kind of 60 hertz. But the reprojection hardware will still be generating unique images on the headset at 120 hertz. And this is actually completely automatic. It's you know, very simple for you to actually put into your games. It's supported in the Unity plugins for PlayStation as well. And it allows you to kind of like still have a rich kind of VR experience on what is like a fixed hardware platform. So I've kind of skipped on to not too much technical detail. I think I had a whole talk for this last year. We're going to talk a bit more about support. So. 
we, of course, this is like Unite, so most of you are actually looking at Unity. And to get Unity on PlayStation, you have to sign up with us. So when, when you're actually signed up as developers, most of your Unity-specific PlayStation support will occur on forums. But these forums are actually part of our wider support organization. And one thing I really want to kind of like hammer home is that even if you only sign up to do something with Unity, as far as Sony is concerned, you're a full professional developer. So we give you the same kind of tools we give to the big companies. And it's important not to just use the Unity editor and then test your program running on PlayStation, but use the kind of performance tools we have, because they can give you a lot of low-level analysis of where the bottlenecks in your code might be, even if it's like something you're not really going into like native code for. Yeah. And in terms of engineering support, we have support engineers. And we're available to help. We have forums. We do visits. You know, if people are interested, we can kind of come out and visit. Even smaller developers, you know, it's something we feel is like quite important. And then you might decide that you're happy with Unity in the first site. You may say you want more performance, so you move away to something that's more bespoke. And we kind of help with the kind of native platform support probably alongside the kind of particular Unity engineers who specialize on PlayStation. And you have access to like both us and those guys on our forums. Uh, I was going to show a lovely demo of the uh, kind of support organization, but unfortunately it's NDA. So here's a smiley face. And that's the limit of my artistic skills. Okay. So, as I said before, we, are, we offer support for all registered companies. So, it's not big companies, it's small indie developers. You are a pro developer as far as we're concerned. Uh, Pierre's already mentioned it before, but the whole idea of platform, platform support for PlayStation is free. Once you're registered, we don't charge for it. So, make use of it. And, you know, we have lots of other things that come up which aren't just offered aimed at kind of Unity, they're actually just aimed at general PlayStation developers. So we do training, we have de uh, developer conferences ourselves, we do kind of webinars and so on. Uh, and, you know, talk to us, like, uh, as I said before, we've got a stand here. Uh, I'm here, a couple of the other engineers, we've got Pierre who handles like submissions. We've also got some of the business guys. So if you're actually interested in like other parts of how to get product to Sony, uh, you can talk to them, and we'll actually have another talk tomorrow, which is more on the, the business publishing side. Okay, and I, I believe we're a nice bunch. It could be a lie, though. I could be an evil bastard. So I'll finish this off. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the performance issues you might have if you move slightly with Unity and how you can like uh, operate to fix those. So. One of the most common things with PlayStation that you get is, because it's a fixed platform and it's a console, it's not the highest end PC you can get. So we find that a lot of the time people end up, especially the people come with Unity type apps, they end up actually CPU bound. You know, really, like, as I said earlier, like, we have AMD kind of Jaguar cores at 1.6 gig. Like, those are actually, you know, of, those are like way lower capacity. They're like half the IPC of even like a high-end steamroll or an i7. And also they're clocked at kind of half the clock rate that you'll see, or to be honest, a third of the clock rate if you take the kind of like the boost clocks on the most modern Intel CPUs. So something that runs really nicely in kind of like .NET and Mono on your PC may actually end up being a bottleneck on PlayStation 4, and also if something that ran really nicely on like a phone that's clocked at 1.5 may end up being a bottleneck if you move it across the Vita because again that's a lower clock. So you really need to kind of think about your CPU strategy. So not just have a single monolithic thread that then does all your kind of strip things. Have use kind of thread in a bit more. Be careful about how you're using Unity. So. Sometimes things like if you've got CPU skinning on uh, and that's fine on PC, you really want to move across the GPU mode 
for kind of the console. Uh, and in terms of threads, it's like we have like eight cores, six and a half of them available for you, or available to use in Unity. So it's really important to like kind of go wide. And because I can't resist having like a really detailed side, I actually have one where I talk a bit, this is a bit about how Unity actually works on PS4. So Unity already uses like two threads. So Core Zero uh, is actually running all the general kind of like game threading, scripting and so on, and the, the Unity like platform agnostic stuff. And then Core One runs a kind of effectively a render thread that handles the kind of like resolving the abstraction and generating the command buffers for the low level. Uh, so we generate like generate some GNM commands which are effectively the kind of low-level GPU commands that you send. And then cores, like, yeah, four cores are also available, and they're shared between kind of Unity game threads uh, that you might use if you're using kind of .NET threading, and any middleware. So if you're using like FMOD or something for audio, they kind of run on those cores. Uh, and if you're using worker threads, uh, we have eight cores, but they, they actually split physically into two clusters of four. So Unity will actually kind of try and prioritize your worker threads to work in kind of pairs. So you can get maximal kind of like a L2 kind of coherency, and you don't actually have to go snooping on the bus between the two clusters. Uh, if you do anything where you're kind of running native threads yourself, like you're say spawning out to C, and you're creating system threads, one thing to watch out, though, is that you don't actually break the kind of link with Unity. You might find that you say you create a thread from the kind of the game core that actually inherits the prior priorities and then stops some of the Unity workers from running. But yeah, it's important to go wide. Uh, I do see lots of games that are kind of still narrow <laughs> and. That's something like the, pr the kind of big teams have actually had to move across this kind of wide thing to get their, their console games. But it's also, as you kind of improve, increase the kind of graphic workloads you're, you're using in your Unity games, or increase the kind of like AI scripting, the number of entities you might actually have, that to get the kind of performance on the games console, you're gonna have to kind of like thread it and understand a bit more about the kind of almost like the parallel Kind of access. But uh, if any of you have Unity kind of stuff, come visit us because I've got the full set of dev tools on the stand. Uh, I can actually do GPU, CPU analysis, show you traces. Uh, and even if you haven't, just come along and have a chat.